Welcome wrestling fans, welcome to Curtain Jerk and as always I am your host Jacob Grindy reporting for the main event Mark's YouTube channel and the Dragon Suplex Podcasting Network. It's been a while guys, dare I say too long. The G1 was great but there was so much wrestling to watch, uh, it kind of gave me little time to collect my thoughts and my opinions about the what I was watching. I also had a birthday in there. That took up a lot of time that I usually would be using recording and putting up a show. Uh, but fear not, guys. I am back, and I am better than ever, just like Eric Bischoff in the Ruthless Aggression era. Just like Road Dog at the live events. That's right. Jeff Jarrett is out of running live events, and Road Dog is back, back in. Which kind of makes sense, you know, the new regime in WB Hunter at the helm, uh, Lee. Jared uh, has good ideas and is good at working non-wrestling people. If you look at his success, you know, in TNA with Dixie for a long time, and even as WCW champion with Russo, he was really good at uh, putting himself in prominent positions when there's non-wrestling people in charge and i guess nick khan was kind of in charge i mean i might be mixing things up a little bit and jeff's Jarrett rose to the top and then all of a sudden a uh, hunter right there and you see his boys come in you know you, you saw uh sean michaels get a promotion and now you see road dog back at it so you know everything kind of makes sense and i honestly think road dog might be better than jeff Jarrett. Uh, as far as uh, behind the scenes, I liked, you know, w uh, NXT Black and Gold more so than I did like a lot of the stuff in TNA. I'll say that much. And it's kind of funny, decades after the Rhodey storyline, you still see these two going at it. More WWE news, NXT Europe, you know, from the ashes of NXT UK becomes NXT Europe. A lot of wrestlers from all over the place for a number of years now. So it kind of makes sense to just call it kind of NXT Europe instead of NXT UK. Uh, I think they should use uh, this new rebranding to set up wrestling shows in cool places. I mean, you obviously aren't going to get the crowds you get for a SummerSlam or for a WrestleMania or a Royal Rumble in NXT Europe, but you will be able to put it, you know, in you know, in front of cathedrals, in inside of cool theaters and stuff. So you can really uh, get the pageantry that's there for a lot of these big WB shows and uh, kind of bring that pageantry out in just like the background of these cool places in Europe. I mean, that's what I would do. Um, some NXT UK talent showed up on NXT proper on Tuesday night. Apparently, the ones who were able to make it to Orlando and willing to make it to Orlando didn't get fired. Um, but there was over 20 you know, people involved in NXT UK that did get fired, unfortunately. Um, I don't see where these wrestlers are going to go. If they're not willing to move to, to Orlando, I can't really see them pop up in AEW too often. I mean, New Japan is in California. Maybe they want to move to California beside, instead of Orlando. Um, but I all I hope that this brings that UK indie scene back to prominence. Like in 2016, before NXT UK existed, um, there was just a thriving indie scene in 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 the United Kingdom. So hopefully, just a release of these 20 or so talents just back into that indie scene. Hopefully, I mean, you got a whole roster of people. You can make a whole new company if you want to. But, I mean, we used to hear all the time about ICW, and you hear all the time about Progress and RevPro a little bit still. Uh, hopefully, this is kind of a shot in the arm because I think that UK indie scene did need a shot in the arm. But that's all that we're going to be saying about WWE this week. We're going to go into AEW Hangman and Punk. we got to talk about it. Uh, I took a month off of AEW, and right as I was about to jump in, Hangman and Punk and Moxley and this whole thing kind of came to be. Kenny Omega came back. So next episode, I'm going to be watching AEW Dynamite, ranking every single match from worst to first like I always do. 
for the first time in a month. It's going to feel great. And what a time to jump back in. Hangman said something that pissed off Punk. Punk chose last week to call him out on live TV when he had to set up a match with Moxley and, uh, you know, did not discuss that he was going to call out Hangman with anybody. But the whole thing is, is, you know, like, what did he expect to happen? Did he expect, like, Hangman was then going to come off script? And then if he did come off script, like, the music play and him come all the way out there, or was he going to come out there with no music? And then if he got in the ring, would it have been, like, a shoot fight? Uh, we all kind of know how that would have gone after seeing CM Punk in the UFC. Uh, but, no, Hangman just stayed in the back. Um, and it was kind of weird for a few minutes. And then he started taking shots at Moxley, which is what he was supposed to do. That was a little crazy. Uh, Punk said Mox is the third best person in his faction, which was a pattern in his career. Mox comes out, said, uh, you think you're the best in the world, but you're most of the time not the best in catering. Every time they do a shout-out to catering, it gets a pop from me, and it got a pop from this West Virginia crowd. We all know uh, you came back because you ran out of money is another shot that Moxley took. Uh, Moxley said that he's writing checks with his the microphone that his body can't cash, and then they drop the microphone, they drop the belts, and it proves correct they started throwing weak ass punches with each other I, I say pick the microphone back up but god damn this was good work shoot shoot work who cares it was great i took a month off of aew because of the g1 and we will talk about the g1 a little later but god damn did i pick up at a good time because i think the first match back if I know how the dynamites are laid out, it's going to be Punk versus Mox. The main event of the pay-per-view, shown on live TV a few days away from the pay-per-view. In my eyes, I think MJF is going to come out and screw Punk over. And that way, you get Punk versus MJF at All Out. And I think that's a good thing because if you look at like the Thunder Rosa title reign, the Hangman Page title reign... AEW is really good at booking the chase for the title. They're a lot better at booking the chase than they are at the title reign. So if you're really trying to get Punk over and keep him over, uh, having him chase the title, win, get injured, and then chase the title another time is a good way to do that. I mean, I don't think that they're thinking of it quite like that, but I think that's what's going to happen. I mean, MJF coming back out and then... AEW is going to be back at full strength. You're going to have, in my eyes, the top talents, uh, which would be Punk, Omega, and MJF. These guys have never, I think, I mean, very for a very short period of time, all three of them were together in the same company. But, I mean, you know, Mox is no slouch either. Him carrying that title would be great. Uh He's, you know, he's carrying multiple titles right now. GCW champion, John Moxley versus Nick Gage, title versus career. I don't think Mox is the one that should retire Nick. Uh, Moxley is a face champion, and Nick Gage is incredibly over here. So I think that, uh, I think that Nick Gage is going to win the GCW title. Uh, I think Nick Gage should retire. He's, you know, can barely move and never really was that good in the first place. But that's neither here nor there. We're going to be going into the G1, guys. Uh, the G1, like I said before, was a little overwhelming. Uh, halfway through, I've, I watched every single match. I have all, what is it, 80, yeah, 86 matches ranked. But I'll spare you listen to those. I don't think just simply reading off 85 matches matches would be entertaining to anybody uh so i think i'm gonna go about this a little differently next year i don't know how but uh yeah i feel like i missed a lot of good AEW, missed a lot of good wwe watched a lot of good wrestling but the new format um doesn't really lend itself to having the best matches year after year anymore it was just a nice long tournament with you know 80 yeah 86 matches all together and I watched them all. Uh, I can't really remember too many of them. There were so many. 
but nonetheless, let's break down the finals. Osprey versus Naito. Great match. Naito has a bit of a Drew McIntyre vibe to him now because he did hold the title the majority of the pandemic like Drew McIntyre. You kind of had to feel for him there, but I do think they need to build new stars, and I think the right guy won here with Will Ospreay. You got to push Ospreay, and uh, we'll get to that a little later as well because we have Okada versus another guy I think they should push, and I think they are pushing Tama Tonga. Tama Tonga, his G1 win was beating Jay White the day before, winning over Bullet Club leader and the IWGP champion kind of solidifies him in that main event level. So having him lose to Okada is okay here because you have kind of his fall and even maybe winter set up just by beating Jay White the day before. And then we're going into the final. Last year's was better as an overall show. You had Zack Sabre Jr. versus Shibata. I thought we were going to get Tom Lawler versus Zack Sabre Jr. in the middle of the card, but we didn't. We got them in a multi-man match throughout the tournament which was good don't get me wrong but i think that this show kind of needed a little oomph instead of the finals and that match would have given it a little oomph and kind of played into what they were kind of building last year and as shitty as it sounds abushi blowing out his shoulder was a big moment and felt super big last year and i think that um this match lacked that i thought abushi was going to win the g1 last year i thought o- Osprey was going to win this year, but we'll get to that because we have Okada versus Osprey. The match we have seen in the G1 before, but never in the finals. The match we've seen in the Tokyo Dome before, uh, Okada brings in Osprey to New Japan years ago. The G1 is what brought Osprey up to the heavyweight ranks years ago, but Okada, you know, wins for a fourth time. I thought this was the story wrote itself here. I thought Osprey was going to beat Okada. I guess he did in the dome, and then now uh, they. I guess they won't. They they won't Okada. I think they won't Okada. Jay White. It looks like that's the way it's going. Okada during his uh, backstage interview says that he needs to wrestle Ibushi uh, from last year. I don't know if that'll ever happen. We'll have to see. Um, and. I, but as much as I kind of wanted them to put it on Osprey, I remember, you know, back at Wrestle Kingdom 9, Okada leaving the, the dome crying because he couldn't beat Tanahashi in the dome. Tanahashi standing tall. And then next year, Wrestle Kingdom 10, it felt that much better and kind of solidified me as a New Japan fan for life when I finally got to see Okada with the title. We've seen Osprey with the title. We haven't seen him win the G1. Are fans clamoring for Osprey to win the G1 like they were clamoring for Okada to beat Tanahashi in the Dome? I don't think so, but you know, you got to set the storyline here. I think long term booking is good. Uh, but we need to kind of build new stars. You tried to build evil. It didn't work. You tried to build Shingo. It feels like you're pulling back on that a little bit. You built Osprey. He got injured. You built Abushi. He got injured. So Abushi still injured. Osprey not injured. Put the rocket on Osprey. He is the guy who's going to bring this company into the future. It looks like we're heading into a lull point in New Japan. I think Osprey is the one guy who can take that title to AEW, take the title to Rev Pro. I mean, fuck it, CMLL, AAA, wherever you need him, he can be there and he can re solidify the New Japan brand on a worldwide stage like it was in 2016, like it was in 2017, like it was in 2018, like it was before the pandemic and before AEW. But let me tell you guys my top 10 matches of the tournament. 86 matches. These are the 10 best. Go out of your way to watch these. Number 10, Tanahashi versus Naito, night 5. Number 9, Finley versus Juice Robinson, night 6. Number 8, Goto versus Naito, night 3. Number 7, Taichi versus Ishii, night 2. Um, that snuck up there. Number 6, Okada versus Tamatanga, block final. Number 5, Osprey versus Shingo, night 12. Number 4, Naito versus Kenta, night 15. Number three, Zack Sabre Jr. versus Kenta, night two. I'm a Kenta mark, you can tell right here. Zack Sabre Jr. also having a great tournament here. Taichi, good early on, was popping his pecs for Sonata, and it kind of all went south, it seems like. Number two, Osprey versus Naito, block final. And number one, Okada versus Osprey, G1 final. 
great tournament. Definitely go out of your way to watch those 10 matches. And don't go out of your way to watch the whole damn tournament again. Uh, I'm beaten. I'm beaten. Uh, too many folly matches. Jonah Rock, though, honorable mention to him, beating Okada. And then in October, we're going to have kind of the best setup ever. Jonah versus Okada and Tamatanga versus JY in that big show they're having in October. So look forward to that. I also looked forward to uh, UFC, was it 279 here? We're creeping up to 300. That's kind of crazy. Uh, Leon Edwards versus Kamaru Usman. Round one, Leon takes Usman down to the ground. They land some strikes as the bell sounds. Round two, Usman swinging, takes some shots, takes Edwards down before the bell. Round three, not much going on here, but you did feel the momentum starting to sway in Usman's favor. Round four, Usman takes down, throws some shots, looking good. Round five, looks like they're just going to give the title to Usman. Uh, all he has to do is survive, uh, but he fucking didn't survive. Announcers were already saying that it was over, but then boom, Edwards lands the kick of his life, the kick right to the champion's dome, knocks him out. I was shocked, not as shocked as Joe Rogan grabbing his, you know, friends from either side of him. Cannot believe it. I mean, I can't believe it either, but the entire time I was reviewing the UFC fight, uh, you know, for this show and everything, re- reviewing just UFC fights, uh... Usman was the man. Usman was unstoppable. He was more or less the story that I was watching this entire time. And here it is. Leon Edwards takes him down. This is crazy to me. Uh, We're going to have to see what happens now. Uh, Great promo at the end uh, by Leon Edwards as well. The promos at the end are almost as good as the fights. uh, and They have been for a while in the UFC. I hope you guys didn't forget about me. I hope you guys are listening to the show. Let me know in the comments below if you liked it. Let me know on Twitter, at JG Pro Wrestling. And hit me up on Instagram, running down underscore DRM. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Fly high. I'm out.